again, welcome to you all. For those of you who weren't with us yesterday evening, I'm Pat DeLure, I'm Associate Academic Vice President of Boston College, and one of the many conference planners. We've been at this for about a year, and we're very pleased to see all of you. I'd like to especially welcome the members of the Association of Catholic Institutes of Secondary Education who are with us this morning. You are women and men from all over the country and all over the world, and we're very pleased that you joined us this morning. Your packets are full of information, including the full schedule for the day, You've received workshop directions, which I'll come back to um, after our speaker this morning. <laughs> Among the items in your packet is an evaluation sheet, which we'd like you to fill out before you leave today. Your input is very important to us especially as we think about continuing these sorts of events in the future. And now I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Elizabeth Johnson, who will speak to us this morning on Coming In From the Cold, Women in the Past, Present, and Future Church. Good morning, everybody. When I arrived here about an hour ago, the place was already half full and it was buzzing with energy. And I turned to my colleague and said, this is women in the church, is what it looks like. This hour of Saturday morning to be gathered together. So it is my great pleasure and honor to be with you this morning and to be part of this conference. Uh, maybe one last point. There's a few seats in the front row, front, front couple rows here for people in the back if you want to come forward and sit. If you want to stand, you can do that too. <laughs> okay. Okay. At one point in her life, the African American essayist Audre Lorde switched from eyeglasses to contact lenses. Reflecting on this experience, she wrote this poem entitled, Contact Lenses. Once I lived behind thick walls of glass, and my eyes belonged to a different ethic, timidly rubbing the edges of whatever turned them on. Seeing was usually a matter of what was behind my brain. Now my eyes have become a part of me, exposed, quick and risky, and open to all the same dangers. I see much better now, and my eyes hurt. <laughs> we have gathered at this conference as part of an ongoing effort to envision the church women want in the 21st century, and particularly in this meeting with a focus on women themselves. Multitudes of women in our day have traded in their eyeglasses for contact lenses with regard to the church. We see much more clearly now where the problems lie and also their solutions, and our eyes hurt. It is a tremendous gift that Boston College is providing an eye clinic of sorts here, <laughs> a forum where we can trade insights and generate enough light to take our next steps into the future. This morning, I have this address in three parts. The first part, rather briefly, I'd like to reflect with you on what gives women the right to envision a kind of church that they might want. And then, in the central part of today's address, we will explore the ambiguity that we inherit from church tradition regarding women. And we will explore that briefly in scripture, in tradition, and in church teaching. And then in the last part, we will draw both of these points into the present to see how in the midst of the current crisis in the church, we can envision the church women want and how doing so as women and men together is a courageous work of hope. So first, the source of women's authority to envision at all. 
Christianity, as you know, took shape in a culture where elite men held power over women, other men, children, and slaves. As the church grew and became more established, its leaders adapted this pattern to the church's own governance. And today we call that pattern patriarchy, or we call it hierarchy. For, and this became pattern of the church's internal life. Through the centuries, the church remained patriarchal as society was. And it gave religious authorization for this pattern of organization. Let me begin by emphasizing that we are talking about a pattern, a structure, a system of organization here that predetermines the roles men and women play. Within this system, some men indeed are humanly mature, spiritually advanced. They may be very nice to women. Indeed, they may even love them. So we are not talking about male bashing here, right? But I am talking about the overarching system whereby the community of disciples, the church, structures its members. And that hierarchical structure, designed and occupied exclusively by elite men, has placed men and women in unequal roles with men ruling over women. The church reflects this inequality in its sacred texts, in its religious symbols, especially the symbol of God, in the way it carries out ritual, in its governance, and in its law. As a result, for most of our history, women have been silent and invisible in the public square of the institutional church. Now this patriarchal pattern of church structure is one reason that this conference has been criticized by some. When I edited the book entitled The Church Women Want, Catholic Theology in Dialogue, which came out two years ago, one critic said it should have been called The Church Jesus Wants. Some argued that men should be envisioning the church too, which I agree, and we have panels on this today. Okay. But the main criticism that I received personally by letter and by voice came from those who said women have no right to envision the church. They should practice the godly virtues of loyalty and obedience to the men in charge and to what they decide is right and true. In response, let us be very clear about what we are doing and why. There is ultimately only one source of authority in the church, namely the Spirit of God, the giver of life and the source of all love. It is the Spirit who enables the community of disciples, the church, to carry the word of Christ forward into the world. It is the Spirit who makes this community, as Edward Skillebeck says, the only real reliquary of Jesus left in the world. In her Madaliva lecture entitled Speaking with Authority, Mary Catherine Hilkert from Notre Dame developed a foundation for why women have a right to envision. What is the source of women's authority in the church? She found three sources. First and most important, baptism. Women are gifted with the Spirit of God in their baptism. This sacrament consecrates a girl profoundly to God. Her whole being, her body and soul, is blessed and made holy with God's own life. Consequently, she, like every baptized person, is called to follow Jesus and share in the work of Christ, which is, as Vatican II put it, to be prophet, priest, and leader. And the baptized are called to share that ministry of Christ within the body of Christ. As you well know, we are in an age of the great rediscovery of the importance of baptism for empowering the laity, which of course includes women in the church. The second source of authority flowing from that is women's actual experience living the Christian life. Over the years, as women walk the path of discipleship, they gain insights into the ways of God with the world. 
Across their whole lifetime, women as men grow in wisdom and grace along with age. And this allows them to discern the truth in love according to the guidance of the spirit. So there's earned credits there, you might say, that give women authority. And third, a source of authority is suffering. Through what they suffer, and suffer in and at the hands of the church, women also gain knowledge of the power of sin and what precisely needs to be done to heal and redeem life for themselves and for others who weep. This, again, to quote Skilobex, is called a negative contrast experience. And by experiencing and suffering what's wrong, we understand what needs to go right in order for our humanity to be honored. So the authority of baptism, the wisdom of life experience, and the power of suffering. These all arise from the gift of the Spirit who consecrates women fully, fully, into the life of Christ, crucified and risen. And this is what gives women the right to envision the church. We speak as persons of faith with the authority of our vocation as disciples of Jesus. Conversely, the growing strength of women's voices about matters of God in our day is, I believe, a real gift to the church and to the world. So with that settled, <laughs> let us then search our heritage for what hinders our envisioning and what can clear up that ambiguity and give it clear direction. And so I'd like to consider with you the major part of this address, the ambiguity of our Christian heritage about women, and to do so in terms of scripture tradition and church teaching. A huge ambiguity about women runs through the Christian heritage. On the one hand are sacred texts and laws that are clearly patriarchal, keeping women in a subordinate role. These sources are appealed to today by those who wish to maintain the status quo. Okay. On the other hand, there are points of light that challenge this arrangement. Let us call this the prophetic strand in our tradition. These sources focus on the solidarity of God with the poor, the dispossessed, and those considered of less importance, including women. These sources are appealed to by liberation theology, feminist, womanist, and mujerista theologies, and other theologies done from the perspective of those on the margins today. Far from supporting the dominance of any one group over another, the prophetic pattern aims at a transformation of the whole church into a community of disciples of equals living by mutual regard. The point I want to emphasize here today is both the patriarchal and the prophetic visions are present in our heritage. Okay? It's neither black nor white. Seek at known, yes and no, to cite a title of a famous medieval book by Abelard. And this, I suggest to you this morning, is a source of hope. Why? Because it makes it clear that what we have been living with under patriarchy is not all there is to Christianity. Something more is possible. So let us consider three different sources. First of all, scripture. You all know how the creation story that opens the Bible says that on the sixth day, quote, God created humankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. Genesis chapter 1. Note how simply this text makes a major claim that women and men together and equally as human beings 
are created in the image and likeness of God. The New Testament inherits this teaching and gives it a Christian twist. An early baptismal hymn had the Christians in Galatia singing, quote, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is no more Jew or Greek, slave or free, male and female, but you are all one in Christ Jesus. Note how simply this text teaches that baptism clothes human beings with Christ equally, without distinction based on race or ethnicity, no more Jew or Greek, or class, no more slave or free, or gender, no more male or female. Why? Because the Spirit gifts them and dwells in them and bathes them all with the life of God without distinction. However, these and many other gleams of light. Notice I just chose one text from the Hebrew Scriptures and one from the New Testament, but there are multitudes of these. Right? These texts got dimmed by cultural custom. The church went forward into a patriarchal society and adapted itself to that society, some suggest, so that it could survive and make headway. In the New Testament, Paul himself is terribly ambivalent, weighing in on whether or not women should wear veils. He writes, a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and reflection of God. But a woman is not. She is the reflection of man. And that is why a woman ought to have a veil on her head. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Later New Testament writers insisted that the equality in Christ due to baptism, which no one has ever denied, okay, but that that equality is only spiritual and should not affect the social order. Wives, be subject to your husbands, Ephesians 5. Slaves, be obedient to your masters, Ephesians 6. And we read more such instructions in the household codes. The first letter to Timothy roots this arrangement in woman's role in the original fall. Quote, let woman learn in silence with all submissiveness. I permit no woman to teach or to have authority over men. She is to keep silence. For Adam was created first and then Eve. And Adam was not deceived. But the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. And yet women will be saved through bearing children." End quote. There you have it. Woman was created second and sin first, and Christ's redemption doesn't seem to make a hill of beans of difference. And this is after the resurrection, you see. How are we to sort this out? We can quote texts back and forth, patriarchal ones versus prophetic ones. But how to discern the essence of the good news? The Second Vatican Council provided a very helpful criterion in the decree on Revelation. They were talking there not about this subject, but about how the findings of modern science sometimes contradicts what we read in the Bible, such as evolution versus the six days in Genesis. And they were also talking about how critical history today sometimes seems to flat out contradict statements of the way things happened in the Bible. And the council taught that what we need to believe in scripture is, and I quote, that truth which God wanted written down for the sake of our salvation, end quote. De Verbum, number 11. That truth which God wanted written down for the sake of our salvation. Salvation is the norm of what binds our conscience. Salvation is what calls us to faith. That is what we give our trust to. Outdated science need not be considered the inspired word of God. Neither must legendary history. Okay. And with even more cogency, we can say today that neither must cultural traditions of oppression. 
The church has already made this judgment with regard to biblical teaching on slavery and the right relationships between slaves and masters. The church no longer teaches slaves be subject to your masters. I suggest that the evils of sexism need to be treated to the same judgment. You see, it's a cultural, not a spiritual truth. Okay? Now, if we take that criterion, the truth that God wanted written down for our salvation, and read the Gospels with that truth in mind, then we will flesh out that criterion with the example of Jesus in his words and his actions. Many biblical scholars today point out how Jesus called both women and men to be his disciples. That women left their homes and responded to his call by becoming itinerant on the road. That he received from these women not only financial support, I always say they bankrolled his ministry, they were the venture capital for that. But read Luke chapter 8, verses 1 to 3, you'll see right there, right? But also he received from them encouragement and even instruction about his own mission. We also know clearly today that when Jesus was arrested, the men ran away, but the women remained faithful witnesses at the cross, at the tomb. We know too that the risen Christ chose them to be the first recipients of the good news of the resurrection. I always say, maybe the fact that they were at the cross because of their fidelity and love for the historical Jesus is one thing, but the fact the risen Christ could have asked anybody to be the first witnesses to the resurrection and opted to uh, choose women. And he gave them in those Easter appearances the apostolic mandate to go and tell the others, which they did even in the face of ridicule. After Jesus' death and resurrection, biblical evidence also shows us that women functioned in the early church as apostles, prophets, teachers, healers, preachers, missionaries, deacons, and leaders of house churches. Read Paul's letters, his salutations, and his farewells. Read Romans chapter 16, where he tells you what the Church of Rome looked like, men and women in various ministries according as the gift was given to them. Scholars finally point out today more generally that Jesus' inclusive table fellowship, his loving words of forgiveness, his criticism of oppressive leaders, and his mandate that leadership is service and must be exercised in washing feet. All this should... <laughs> <laughs> and having feet washed. <laughs> All this should prevent his community from setting up a system of dominance and oppression, you see. I had this text prepared before the events of Holy Week. I did. But one thing I would just comment, and I'm going off text here. The question of whether women are not was at, were at the Last Supper or not is what plays into our Holy Thursday disputes. Um, most scholars would agree today, Jesus did not ordain anybody ever, let alone at the Last Supper. So that whole part of the discussion, it's not what's at stake, all right? But every gospel points out that the women who followed Jesus in Galilee followed him up to Jerusalem in his last days and they reappear at the cross, at the tomb, at the empty tomb, and then uh, proclaiming the message on Easter morning. So you ask yourself the question, what happened to them during that meal? Where did they go? You see. Is it conceivable that Jesus, who exercised a, a radically inclusive hospitality around his table, would have said, you know, uh, women, step outside, please, for this meal while I do this thing with my 12 men here? It's inconceivable. It's, it's how you read the Gospels as a whole that gives you that understanding. So I keep saying, we have to paint more faces into Da Vinci's Last Supper. You know, a, we need the community was there. And I think that that's historically arguable. There is a text in Matthew's Gospel after Jesus feeds the 5,000, and many of you know this, it's the name of a book by Megan McKenna. Um, Matthew concludes that account by saying, and those who ate that day numbered 5,000 men, not counting the women and children. 
which means there were many more than 5,000 who ate that day. But that phrase, he's honest about, in other words, they don't count in a patriarchal picture. So because they're not mentioned in a story written with that attitude, doesn't mean they weren't there. That's another way of arguing that, okay? Anyway, as you can see from the wrangles that we're having over scripture, the prophetic interpretation of scripture is peering through the fog of centuries to glimpse women's participation in founding the church. As we know, the church opted for a patriarchal path, suppressing female leadership in the developing orthodox ecclesial community. But it can be argued that the alternative is more in line with Jesus' own practice and design. Seek at known. What did God want written down for the sake of our salvation? I think, interpreted with prophetic vision, Scripture nourishes our hope. Now let's move to tradition. The same ambiguity about women that we find in Scripture perdures throughout tradition. Christianity was committed from the beginning to women's capacity to be redeemed, to be baptized equally with men, and to attain eternal life. None of that has ever been denied. At the same time, a terrible bias against the dignity of women's full humanity grew and plagued even the most influential of men thinkers. By now, you may well have come across Tertullian's teaching that women are the second Eve. You know, he's playing off 1 Timothy that we read before. Just as, and this is, this is Tertullian's words, just as you softened up with your cajoling words, he whom the devil himself could not attack outright, see, women then, he concludes, are the gateway to the devil. You have no doubt come across how Augustine allowed that women's souls were indeed capable of being truly the image of God. But women as female, that is, as sexual in our bodies, is not in the image of God, says Augustine, but can be considered such only when taken together with man, who is her head. Whereas man taken alone is as fully the image of God as when he is with his woman. Everyone by now seems to know Thomas Aquinas' definition of woman as a defective male, misbegotten when the male seed at conception is not up to its full strength. Just read the Summa question 92 in part one and you will get Aristotelian biology, which he just adopted. It was the science of his day. Okay. Perhaps you are not as familiar with Martin Luther's view Writing of the fact that women had to live under the power of their husband, he wrote, this punishment, calling it what it really is, springs, <laughs> springs from original sin. The rule remains with the husband, and the wife is compelled to obey him by God's command. He rules the home and the state, wages wars, defends his possessions, tills the soil, builds and plants, and so forth. The woman, on the other hand, is like a nail driven into the wall. She sits at home, looking after the affairs of the household, deprived of administering affairs outside or anything that concerns the state. In this way is Eve punished. So the Reformation didn't do too much for us either. Anyway. Centuries of theologians drew from and contributed to the classical Christian doctrine of women's inferiority and their need to be subject to men. Now, as with any prejudice, once this gets repeated often enough, it begins to be taken for granted. And over time, women begin to internalize the self-image that this oppressive system feeds them and instinctively think of themselves as less than worthy. Not all. We've always had feisty women who refused that definition. But it becomes a pervasive idea that affects all, men and women, in some way. Said Contra, right, on the other hand, women's movements throughout Christian history have either hung on to or rediscovered 
the liberating framework of equality that subverts this patriarchal view and offers a radical alternative. In patristic and medieval times, some women perform the radical act of rejecting patriarchal marriage, see, saying they belonged only to Christ and men had no dominion over them. Some of them were martyred for that in the early church. And in the Middle Ages, they formed monastic communities where together as women, they could pursue their relationship to God and one another undeterred. Some women were mystics who experienced God in the nearness of Christ directly in their hearts and were able to image God back both in male and female terms. In Julian of Norwich's famous visions, she affirms, and I quote, God, all wisdom, is our kindly mother. Yes, as truly God is our father, so truly God is our mother." End quote. Her writings are the flowering in medieval women's mysticism of this fluid and gender-inclusive understanding of the mystery of God. Some women remained outside convent walls, becoming involved as laywomen in church reform by sheer dint of their call from God. Catherine of Siena, for example, gave strong directions to the Pope, and she was a laywoman. Okay? At one point, she wrote to Gregory XI, rebuking his choice of pastors and cardinals, saying, quote, they are stinking weeds, full of impurity and avarice, and bloated with pride, whereas the church deserves pastors who will be true servants of Jesus Christ with care for the poor, end quote. And she is a doctor of the church. <laughs> of course, in addition to singular women, there have always been anonymous, the millions of unnamed women who have ignored the church's definition of their inferiority and built up the Christian tradition through their quest for God, their creative initiatives, their prayer, their service, and their love. Again, the ambiguity that we inherit. Seek at known. There is a patriarchal teaching about women, but there is an alternate prophetic stream, this time not in theory, unfortunately, so much as in practice. Third, the teaching of the magisterium. In this era of women's equality socially, the official church has rapidly shifted away from the traditional teaching of women's inferiority. Vatican II sounded the new drumbeat loud and clear from general statements filled with implications such as the whole church is called to holiness or Christ is present in the whole assembly gathered at Eucharist. Okay? From that to explicit teachings, one of the most important, I think, is in the Church in the Modern World, paragraph 29, where the Council writes, with respect to the fundamental rights of the person, every type of discrimination, whether social or cultural, whether based on sex, race, color, social condition, language, or religion, is to be overcome and eradicated as contrary to God's intent, end quote. And if you parse that out, the first condition by which we discriminate that's mentioned here is sex, based on sex. And something that is contrary to God's intent, we call very simply a sin. So what the council has said in so many words is that sexism is a sin. See? Perhaps nowhere has this shift been more stri strikingly articulated than in the encyclicals of Pope John Paul II. Rather than repeat the old canards, he vigorously maintains the equality of women and men in creation and in redemption. In his 1988 encyclical entitled On the Dignity of Women, he writes, quote, both man and woman are human beings to an equal degree. Both are created equally in God's image. Again, he says, quote, a human being is a person, man and woman equally so, since both were created in the image and likeness of the personal God. The whole letter is filled with this affirmation, which can now also be found in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Clearly, the ambiguity 
that saw woman's human dignity as less worthy than man's is being cleared up in theory. However, this does not lead the magisterium to posit equality in the social structures of church life. The clearest example here is the ordination of women to the ministerial priesthood. In 1976, acknowledging that the reason given in the past why women could not be ordained, namely women's inferiority as human beings, acknowledging that that's inadequate a reason in our day. The Vatican document entitled Inter Insignores brought forth three new reasons why the church cannot ordain women. One, the example of Jesus who ordained only 12 men. Two, the unbroken tradition of the church on this point. And three, the iconic argument that holds that the priest has to look like the male Jesus in order for the sacrament of the Eucharist to have its natural symbolic value. Subsequently, these reasons have been buttressed in the writings of Pope John Paul II by a dualistic view of human nature that, based on biological sex, interpolates that the characteristics of masculine and feminine nature are by nature different and interpolates from that that social roles therefore must be different. Masculine nature is fitted with rationality and the ability to lead, therefore fitting men for the public realm. And feminine nature is essentially oriented to love and nurturing the vulnerable, thereby equipping women for life in the private realm. Now, as an aside, let me note that these reasons have been so consistently unconvincing that 20 years later, in 1996, the Vatican issued another statement saying that women cannot be ordained, period, and that this is authoritative teaching and that the discussion is ended. It is a good example of the depth of patriarchal resistance to women's equality in discipleship. It's, it's heartrending to note that officials of the church are less willing to sit down and discuss women's ordination in an open collegial and rational manner, less willing to do that, than they are to sit down with other Christian churches to discuss contentious issues such as the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, the divinity of Christ, or even the inner life of the Trinitarian God, all of which are subjects of ecumenical dialogue. So looking at official church teaching in the past decades, the same ambiguity is with us. There is repetition of the patriarchal ideas, some in new guises, but there is also a startlingly strong affirmation of prophetic ideas about women's equality and human dignity. To me, it seems that the tension between these two contemporary kinds of church teaching is not tenable over the long haul. Using the criterion from Vatican II, which one is there for the sake of our salvation? What do we envision? So in this very brief review of our heritage, we can see that in scripture and tradition and the teaching of the magisterium, we find great ambiguity with regard to women. And this makes the tradition today open, I believe, to both patriarchal and prophetic interpretations. Again, seek it known. We are caught right now in a conflict of interpretations over our heritage. The good news is that there is light from our heritage for those who wish to envision a church where women can flourish and where men and women together can be a community of discipleship of equals. So my final point, envisioning today. Let us take the authority of women, point one, and the ambiguity of our heritage, point two, and draw them into the present task of envisioning the church women want. Sorry to report, coming into the present day does not remove us from ambiguity. Our present moment is shaped by two powerful forces on this subject. The movement for women's equality with men and the resistance to that movement from entrenched patriarchal interests. Now these forces 
first emerged in civil society, right? The women's movement and the resistance to it, okay? But they quickly had a powerful impact on the church because we do not live schizophrenically, you know, one half of ourselves in society and one half of ourselves in the church. The 20th century saw the rise of the women's movement in the Western nations to begin with, but it swiftly became an issue of global importance. What made it start at this time? Education that increased female literacy. Medical technology that allowed women control of their own fertility. And access to the workplace that allowed women a measure of economic independence. Above all, it was impelled, the women's movement, by growth in human consciousness as part of the liberation movements in the 20th century that granted to women the full measure of the dignity of the human person. Women themselves took the lead in this consciousness raising, lifting up their voices to have this equality written into law. Women of color, of different racial and ethnic identity, lesbian women, and women of poorer economic status have all insisted that in addition to gender, all other aspects of women's concrete lives must be accorded the respect due to the human person. And this in turn challenges the conscience of white middle-class women like myself. This equality, this dream of equality of women with men changes the landscape of our imagination with concrete implications. UN statistics paint a sobering picture of the worldwide condition of women against which this women's movement needs to be seen. And we're still talking globally here before we get to the church. Women form one half of the world's population. However, they do three fourths of the world's work receive one-tenth of the world's income, own one one-hundredth of the world's land. Think of it, 99% of the planet is owned by men. Women form two-thirds of illiterate adults, and together with their dependent children, form three-fourths of the world's starving people. And to make a bleak picture worse, women are raped, battered, prostituted, sold into sexual slavery, and murdered by men to a degree that is not mutual. Violence against women is rampant on a global scale, including domestic violence. Yet women bear the dignity of the human person and should enjoy all the rights and responsibilities that go with that dignity. As the UN Declaration at Beijing in 1995 declared, however, in no country in the world is that yet the case. So the movement for women's equality is at root, to put this in ethical terms, it is a movement for social justice on a global scale. Now a superficial glance would have one think that this issue would be embraced by the church in the light of its basic teachings about social justice. And in a doctrinal sense, this has happened as we saw. But in practical matters, Opposition to the advance of women into public participation, once this becomes an inner church question, this opposition has become entrenched in our day, as we also saw. Here's our ambiguity again, right? But meanwhile, in the teeth of this new resistance, new sociological facts have taken shape on the ground. Today, many thousands of Catholic women including, I imagine, many women who are here, are involved in church ministry. More than 80% of the ministry done in parishes today is carried out by women. Women provide the bulk of catechists, Catholic school teachers, DREs, charitable service workers, and volunteers of all kinds. Women serve in liturgical roles as lectors, Eucharistic ministers, and cantors. They function as parish administrators where priests are unavailable, and in those settings, lead communion services, which include preaching at the liturgy of the word. They also work as diocesan chancellors, judges in marriage tribunals, seminary professors, and professional staff in church agencies. 
Along with laymen, women increasingly head up the three great areas of Catholic contribution to American society, schools and colleges, health care, and social service agencies. In addition, there has been a blossoming of women's scholarship. Women are now active in fields of biblical research, church history, systematic theology, ethics, and spirituality, bringing women's wisdom to bear on the whole range of Christian doctrines, symbols, ethics, and rituals. Now, with this growing participation of women in the life of the church today, has come enormous tension within women themselves, spiritual tension, due to their ongoing exclusion. Two areas in particular stand out. Decision-making. Doctrinal teachings, laws, and ethical mandates are still handed down from circles of men without the participation of women, even when this affects women most intimately, especially in their bodies. And secondly, sacramental life. Women are aware of their exclusion from Eucharistic leadership, and this eats at the heart of their liturgical experience. As Rosemary Ruther once put it, women come to the Eucharist hungry for the word of God and the bread of life, and they leave starving. Why? Because women's experience is not allowed to interpret the word of God in preaching, and the rite itself works like all good sacraments do. It effects by signifying. Eucharistic liturgy remains a presiding symbol of the Church's reluctance to include women fully in the mysteries of salvation. Now, into this fraught situation, where the immovable object of patriarchy is encountering the irresistible force of women's desire and full participation in the life of the Church, into this situation, like a bomb, has dropped the sex abuse scandal. We have experienced the dreadful revelations of moral corruption among a small percentage of Catholic priests and the failure of a greater percentage of Catholic bishops to protect the innocent from harm. This has been accompanied by a lack of accountability for the use of financial resources of the church, large amounts being secretly paid to bury the knowledge of what happened. The sex abuse scandal in this country has simply undermined people's trust in the leadership of the hierarchical church. Its structures are hemorrhaging their traditional authority. We now have what one writer has called a perfect storm. Lay people are scandalized and outraged. Good priests are demoralized. Many bishops are profoundly compromised and an increasingly reactionary Vatican bureaucracy is clueless about the seriousness of what's happening. No. The responses of competent laity in Voice of the Faithful and other forums and movements for reform are met in many institutional quarters with fear and disdain. Nevertheless, they are the green shoots of hope that will bring us into the future, I believe. I would point out that for three decades up till now, feminist theology has continually analyzed the dark side of hierarchical patriarchy, where a clerical elite has power without accountability and operates according to its own in-house norms. This scholarship was largely ignored but the sex abuse scandal has now made its analysis terribly relevant. It has never been clearer that the church needs transformed structures, fully transparent and accountable to its members. And to quote Teresa Cain in her groundbreaking address to the Pope in 1979, this will not come about with, quote, the full participation of women in the ministries of the church, end quote. The time has never been riper for envisioning the church women want. Now let me conclude. In his recent book on the church entitled A People Adrift, Peter Steinfeld's religion writer for the New York Times 
makes an astute observation. The Catholic Church in the United States, he writes, is currently going through two major transitions. The first one is generational. From older folks who grew up in a strong cultural Catholicism with its devotions and feasts and schools and observances, so that Catholicism was bred in one's bones. To younger generations born and brought up after Vatican II, where this form of cultural Catholicism dissolved in the light of church reforms, so that younger people hold their Catholic identity more loosely or more openly, or even in a more confused way. Inevitably, the, the people who experienced Catholicism before Vatican II are going to die. Right? <laughs> and you're going to have a whole Catholic church that doesn't know how it used to be. You see? And the only thing they know is since Vatican II. And they haven't caught, we haven't passed on the fullness of that kind of, well, we can't because it's a different cultural setting. Many, many are committed, many have caught the essence of what it means to be Catholic. I'm not saying that. But generationally, it's a different phenomenon. And the second transition he points out is a leadership one, that except for the liturgy, leadership in every aspect of church life is passing from the clergy to the laity. That is, to people who have not been through seminary training, who may well be married, have children, and other commitments in society. Think of the leaders of Catholic colleges and universities, of hosp Catholic hospitals, of Catholic charities, vast majority already are laymen and women, committed to the church, but not clerics. These two, he suggests, are seismic shifts. They're happening beyond anyone's control, and how we negotiate them will determine the vitality of the future of the church in this country. Now, in the context of these major transitions, generational and leadership, and maimed by the sex abuse scandal, in a wor world rife with poverty, hunger, the violence of war, and ecological devastation, the church, the community of disciples in this country, is trying to find its way. And in the midst of this, women in the church are part of the global movement pressing forward with hunger for equality befitting our human dignity. A claim, however, being resisted by the patriarchal culture in which the church is sedimented at this point. To say that these are perilous times is an understatement. But thanks to women claiming the authority of their baptism, their lived experience in faith, and their suffering, and thanks to the men who stand with them, and thanks to the recovery of the prophetic liberating strand within scripture and tradition and church teaching, I believe there is reason for hope. To conclude on this note, the feminist writer Marge Piercy wrote a poem whose imagery I have always loved. Quote, we must shine with hope, gleam like stained glass windows that shape light into icons, glow like lanterns in the procession. For who can bear hope back into the world but us? The church is the redemptive community called to bear the hope, the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ into the world. Again and again, this community fails and becomes a collaborator in domination within and without. But the power of the Holy Spirit, holy wisdom, is at work in this community, and again and again the community rises. I believe we are living in such a moment, and what is new about it for the first time in church history is that women are silent and invisible no longer. Envisioning the church women want, I believe, is a work of the Spirit of God and she will not be quenched. Thank you. <laughs>